Good to be here this morning. What time is it? 11.20. All right. That's a check. Sometimes I say this morning and it's like 3 or 5 or 6 p.m. But good to be here. It's colder than I expected. I got to be honest with you, San Antonio. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Thought it was going to be hot, but it's okay. I love you. I had barbecue last night at Rudy's. Rudy. Yeah. It was, all right, some barbecue fans. Yeah. <laughs> I, too, am a fan. Yeah, I, I'm still digesting it, I think. <laughs> just, I ordered way too much food, but that's okay. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. I hope you brought your Bibles uh, with you. If not, you can just look at the screens. I just brought my screens with me. These are actually mine. Um, so we're going to turn to a bunch of scriptures this morning, if that's okay. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is sin and grace, sin and grace. And I'd like to give us a little bit of a theological um, backdrop of sin and grace, what the Bible has to say about sin and what the Bible has to say about grace. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, let's look at our, our first passage of scripture. Uh, J, uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. We Look at that. It's up, way to go, volunteers, radio, video team, radio. What am I talking about? <laughs> radio team. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who has sinned? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is a falling short of God's purposes and God's plans. God is good. He loves you. He's got plans for you. And, and he's, there's a glory even for you that God has designed. And we fall short of that. And all of our sin is essentially falling short of God's sort of perfection and his desire and his plans. The Greek word for, for sin, hamartia, means to miss the mark. And so we miss the mark. Uh, of what God has for us. And ultimately, that's what sin is. It's a missing of the mark. It's falling short. And we all do it. We've all done it, and we all do it. Let's look at our next passage of Scripture, James 1, 13 to 15. James, 13, uh, 1, James 1, 13 to 15. By the way, James is Jesus' brother, which is amazing if you think about it. You can fool your friends. You can tell your friends that you're God. Maybe they'll believe you, but you can't fool your family. Okay, I don't know if, this is, if there's a better proof of Jesus' divinity than the fact that his brother believed that he was God and wrote some scripture about him. That's amazing. Um, James says this, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God didn't make you go to the club last night. Okay? You went to the club. <laughs> Don't blame the devil. You did it. Okay? Um, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own desire, their own desire, and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So we see that desire, this is sort of the dig digression of sin, or where does sin come from? A lot of people ask me in New York, one of my responsibilities as teaching pastors is to teach our, our evening college. And a lot of the questions that I get, where did sin come from? Did God create sin? If God created everything, didn't God create sin? Not so fast. God created free will moral agents. The angels are free will moral agents, and humanity is our free will moral agents. God's created free will moral agency. It's kind of a theological term for the, the, the fact that you have a choice. God didn't create you to be a robot. I think that the reason why God created us with free will moral agency is so that we could love him. We could choose to love him. You know, robots can't love you. Contrary to popular belief. <laughs> you need to have a will in order to be loved. And God wants to be in relationship. He can't be in relationship with a robot. God wants, desires relationship and he desires love. God is love. It's who he is and he's made us after himself. We're made in the image, the imago Dei of God. And so he's created us that way. I don't know why God gave us choice. I don't know why he didn't create us all a bunch of robots that just did whatever he said, but he didn't. And he thought it was a good idea for us to be able to have choice. And desire comes from that choice. God didn't create... Uh, so, so we're sort of in a big fat hurry to give God um, credit for things that he's not necessarily desiring credit for a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so for example, um, like God didn't create the atomic bomb, 
We created the atomic bomb. Right? God didn't create AK-47s. We've created those. God's not responsible for ISIS. ISIS is responsible for ISIS. Okay? And obviously the devil's at play, um, and he's working evil. But, but as James said here, look, a, lo- a lot of our sin, our sin comes from our desire. When we think about Eve and the serpent in the garden, uh, there ha- you me- do you remember the story in Genesis chapter 3? Eve is having this, this conversation with, with the serpent. The serpent saying, Eve, if you uh, take this fruit and you eat it, you're going to be like God to know the difference between good and evil. And ultimately, uh, when Eve reached out her hand and took that fruit, that was just an outward manifestation of something that had inwardly transpired in Eve. Eve had a desire to liberate herself from dependence upon God. That, that, that desire to go, oh, I could mean I could know the difference between good and evil. I wouldn't need to depend upon him, but I could be independent. I could be master of my own fate. That desire gave birth to Eve's reaching and transgressing God's law and eating of God's tree. By the way, that tree is God's tree. It's not, it doesn't belong to us. We were, we were allowed to eat of any other tree in the garden. But that fruit, we, we can't digest the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, we're sort of finding that out in the age of technology. I don't know about you, but I watch the news for one minute and I'm already sick of it. Right? Like, I'm just like, yeah, I can't, I can't stomach this. I can't, I can't stomach knowing all of the bad things that happen in the world. You following me? Yeah. Only God can. God is able to know every terrible thing and still be perfect, just, holy, and God. We can't eat of that. That's sort of the cosmic lesson. Don't eat my food. <laughs> right? Don't try to be like me. We're learning that we're terrible at being God. We make a mess of everything. And so sort of the cosmic lesson is, God, you're God. We're not. We can trust you. It's a great lesson that humanity's needed to learn. God's not just dealing with us on an individual level. He's also dealing with us on a corporate level. Um, All right, let's look at our next passage of Scripture. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who was forever praised. I call this verse the root of sin or the origin of sin. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. So sin is ultimately at its root a rejection of God as creator. God's the creator. That means that he knows everything about his creation. He knows, get this, he knows all about you. He knows what makes you happy. God knows how to please you better than you know how to please you. God knows how to satisfy you better than you know how to satisfy you. And so when we sin, what we're saying is, God, I don't trust that you have good intentions towards me. And that your way ultimately leads to my happiness. I'm taking matters into my own hands. I know how to please me. Thank you very much. That's sin. It's the root of sin. It's rejecting him as the person who knows ultimately everything about you, everything about life, and kind of becoming the captains of our own fate, essentially doing what Eve did and what Adam did over and over and over and over again. We have to, as we follow Jesus, and following Jesus ultimately is this journey that we're on of learning to trust God. Learning to trust that he really can satisfy me better than I could ever satisfy me. John Piper calls it Christian hedonism. That we have to get, like God's not opposed to pleasure. Why do we think as Christians that God is opposed to our happiness? That's a lie from the devil that that the devil would love for you to believe. That God's not all about pleasure. Are you kidding me? At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. God's all about good things and pleasure. Do you believe that? That's essential to trusting God. That's, it's essential to trusting God and rejecting sin. Christian hedonism, be, be the, knowing that God wants to please you and that if we live by his way, we will be so much more satisfied than uh, this other hedonism. 
If you are about pleasure, do life the way God wants you to do life. You'll be super pleased. Isn't that cool? So when we choose the right thing, we're, hed- we're Christian hedonists. Yeah, I'm choosing pleasure. Well, this is pleasure. Well, no, it's not. It's a lie. It's a mirage. This is true pleasure. I'm going to be so happy if I trust God because he's the creator. I tr- he knows how to please me more than I know how to please me. I'm preaching now. All right, Romans chapter 5. Is this okay? Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. What is this scripture saying? Sin entered to the world through Adam, and death entered through sin, and in this way death came to all people. I am not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. I have a biological and spiritual disposition towards sinning. I've inherited it from Adam. I have this this first nature that's in me, and so it's my my knee-jerk reaction to sin. I've inherited it from Adam. It's kind of frustrating, you know? But but we can't can't necessarily be that frustrated with Adam because we all would have sinned regardless. I would have sinned so much faster than Adam. I can't believe it took him that long. Right? I would have been up in that tree, apples in my loincloth, you know, one in my mouth. You know? God's like, you've been awake, you've been alive for two seconds. I'm like, sorry. I'm fiercely rebellious. I'm fiercely, I want my independence. I don't like being dependent. I don't know about you, but I come into church on Sundays, and if a worship leader tells me to lift my hands, I'm like, no way, dude. (laughs) Not now, not ever, not for you. (laughs) I don't like being told what to do. I don't like being dependent upon anybody. I don't want to pray for miracles. I want money to pay pay for the miracles, right? God, I don't want to be dependent on you. I'm just going to work hard. I'm going to save my money. I'll sort it out. You following me? Yeah. Right? I want to be in charge. And this is the issue, is that I'm a, I'm a, it's, it's sin operating in me. I've inherited that from Adam. Another great example of, of inherited sin is my, my, my niece, nep- or my niece, my niece, nephew. That's boy. Yeah. <laughs> niece is girl. Her name's Francesca. We call her Frankie. And she needs the Lord. <laughs> She's three. And um, she, I'm obsessed with her. Okay, I FaceTime Frankie probably two or three times a day. I haven't FaceTimed her yet. I'm going to FaceTime her probably after this message. And she's the first, there's three, uh, three of us, and I'm the oldest one, and then my, bro- my younger brother Gabe, and then my sister Tiffany. Gabe and I don't have kids yet. Um, and then uh, my, my, my younger sister, Tiffany, she just had another baby, but Frankie's been the first one of the family, and everybody's obsessed with her, and I'm obsessed with her. Anyways, Frankie's three, and my sister, like, you know, in birth order, the first one, you know, the parents messed the first one up really bad. I'm messed up. <laughs> Second one, even more messed up. Like, middle childs are weird. And, um, and then the last one, parents typically get right. You know, like, my sister is right. Like, Tiffany, my parents got her perfect. My sister is so holy that she floats, right? Like, she's perfect. She's never sinned, ever, right? Like, her husband is, like, the only guy she ever kissed. It's weird. It's like, you know, she obeyed him. She was daddy's little girl, all that stuff. Anyways, um, so, so she, she's perfect. She's married to, to Brian. Brian, we thought she was marrying down. When actually, she, she's married up. Brian's, like, the most incredible guy. He's a pastor at my dad's church. Best dude ever. Like you, you feel like you're with Jesus when you're with him. <laughs> and then there's Frankie. <laughs> right? Two perfect parents and then evil demon child. <laughs> like Frankie is nuts. Um, she's super, she's in this rebellious stage right now where she'll do the, the opposite, just like bold face rebellion. She'll do the opposite. 
Um, my, my, my sister's like pulling her hair out, like going nuts, like what are we, what are we doing wrong? And like, you're not doing anything wrong. You're like, it's, it's, it's the inherited sin nature. You know, like nobody taught Frankie to be this way. Although sometimes I do wonder if she's demon possessed. <laughs> You know, but like she, which is why I love her though. I kind of love her for that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm sick. Um, but so I'll FaceTime her. For example, I'll FaceTime her and she'll be on the couch. And, you know, so my sister will be like, oh, you, you want, okay, Frank, she knows. So she, my, we don't even say hi anymore. I'm just like Frankie, you know, like, so we go over and she'll, my sister will put, and Frankie will be sitting there like popcorn. She's watching Paw Patrol, which is her show. And she'll be like, she'll look over and she'll be like, not now, Uncle Nate, I'm watching Paw Patrol, you know? <laughs> and I'll be like, come on, Frankie, I love you, you know? And then my sister will go, Frankie, don't talk to Uncle Nate. And then Frankie will grab the phone. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> So we get her to do the opposite of what, you know, we tell her, which is terrible parenting. <laughs> also, um, but it's that, that sin nature working in her, right? That rebellious, and I'm that way. In tr- I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm a professional Christian. <laughs> but I'm still dealing with that even in worship. On, you know, where I, I, I don't, I don't want to sing songs sometimes. I don't want to lift my hands. I don't want to worship. I don't want to... What is it? It's that nature, that's inherited sin nature that's at work in me. John 3.19, Jesus says this. It's absolutely incredible. Sin is a love problem as well. This is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light. I love darkness. I love doing bad things. <laughs> Not only do I love doing bad things, I love good things too much. Because I'm a sinner, and because I have this nature, I corrupt everything. Look what we've done to sex. Sex is good. Sex was God's idea. P.S. Let that mess with your theology. <laughs> come on, God invented it. God's not opposed to pleasure. He loves it. But we put secondary things as first things and corrupt them. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory. Netflix is a great example. When it comes to Netflix, I'm Gollum and Netflix is the ring of power. (laughs) Transforming me from a human to something other than human. Right? My wife and I watched this show called The Great British Baking Show. Okay? Okay? There's nothing wrong with that show. It's a good show, right? There's no sin at all. It's just people baking and having fun. But of course, I find a way to make it evil, and I just binge watch it for five days, and you know, after three days, I'm eating raw fish, and I haven't showered. I take good things, and I make them wrong. Matthew 5:27. I also do this thing where I have, I have, a, a, I played this tally game with God. God, I've done these bad things, and you know, oh, I did this, th- you know, three days ago. I was mean to my wife, and so, Lord, you can't talk to me right now. And, you know, I'm not going to talk to you because obviously you're angry. And, but I've done this couple good things, so maybe we can be friends right now. You know, the, you know, the tally game. Jesus said, you've heard it that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we're all adulterers because of Brad Pitt. (laughs) Right? Like, facts. My wife would leave me for Brad Pitt. We're we're laughing because it's true. Right? So Jesus just looks at the, oh, you think that you haven't done anything wrong? P.S. Your heart's garbage. Matthew 12, 36. Matthew 12, 36. This, is, this ruins the tally game. I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word, every idle word, every useless word they have spoken. Can you imagine giving account to God for every dumb thing that you said? Like, I'm standing before the throne and God's like, all right, let's deal with everything you've said that's wrong. I'd be like, do we, ha- we only have eternity. You know, is that going to be enough time? The truth is that... Um, that, that, that we need a righteousness that's not our own. And that's why we have Jesus. If you've received Jesus, you've received a righteousness, the Bible says, that's not your own. There's no sin in Jesus Christ. And because there's no sin in Jesus Christ, by the way, do you believe that, that there's no sin in Jesus? Was he the obedient, perfect son that fulfilled 
you know, the, the, the requirement of the law and he's perfectly pleased the Father? Do you believe that this morning? If you've received Jesus, you've received the righteousness of God. So when you stand before God on judgment day, it's just, God just sees Jesus. You have a righteousness that's not your own. So, righteous, so the day of judgment for Christians is a day of reward. God, you know, what, what idle words were said? There's no idle words in Jesus. There's no idle words in me. Positionally, I'm righteous before the Father. That's a really great thing. Otherwise, you're stuck playing the tally game with God. Matthew, uh, Romans 5. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitation, just as you also offer yourselves as a slave to impurity. Uh, I don't think that this is the right passage of Scripture. Interesting. Huh. Okay. The passage I was looking for, maybe it's Romans, uh, it might be the next, the next part, Romans, uh, Romans 5, maybe try 523. It's Okay. The, 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 in, in Romans chapter 5, I can't remember what, what verse it is, but it's, it, it basically it says this, that where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. Where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. Essentially that, that by one man's disobedience, sin came into the world through Adam, but through Jesus' perfect obedience, grace came into the world. And so where there is sin, see, God's fix for sin isn't just mercy. God's fix for sin is grace. What does mercy do? Mercy covers. But what does grace do? Grace empowers. Grace doesn't just cover. Mercy is an aspect of grace. But grace empowers you to be who you're called to be and to do what you're called to do. So God didn't fix the sin problem with humanity by just forgiving us and then saying, hey, I'm not going to have a relationship with you anymore, though. I forgive you, but go and try to figure things out on your own. No, God's just been like, no, I forgive you, and here's a Ferrari. That's the grace of God. It's Ferrari grace. If you're taking notes, you can write that down, Ferrari grace. By the way, if you're taking notes, you get extra points in heaven. It's in the Bible somewhere. Near the maps. Um, the grace of God is the fix for sin, not just mercy. Mercy is when you come before the judge. The judge says, I'm not going to hold you to that. I know you're guilty of it, but I'm letting you go. That's mercy. Right? You can walk free. I know that you did this. We caught you, but we're having mercy on you. The grace of God is, we're letting you go, and here's the Ferrari. The Ferrari grace. What is the grace of God? Let's look at it uh, in, in uh, this passage of scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. This is the apostle Paul talking. I am what I am. So once again, the grace of God will allow you to be who you're called to be. Once you are who you're supposed to be, you're doing flows from your being. So I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Grace is never without effect. Grace is always tangible and palpable. God doesn't just forgive you and then not work with you or work in you. There's always an effect of God's grace because it's his empowerment. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul, what are you talking about? You have a split personality. You just said that you worked harder than everybody, but it wasn't you, it was the grace of God that was with you. Which one was it? Was it you or was it the grace of God? Here's an example, in the, or a metaphor rather. Did you drive to church today? Yes, but no. The car did all the work. You steered here. <laughs> right? Why are you taking credit for it? You didn't drive. If you, can you imagine if you walked here, you, would, like, you wouldn't be here right now, right? You'd be stranded on the highway. Take a long time. You wouldn't get to your destination. The Ferrari grace of God gets you to your destination in Christ Jesus. It allows you to be who you're called to be and do what you're called to do. You cannot live the Christian life without the grace of God. Mercy doesn't get the job done. 
Because God's call for you is so much bigger and larger and better and stronger than that. And you need the grace of God to please God. God knows this. That's why he's given us grace. Grace is the upward draft of heaven. It's that Ferrari power towards you. You begin to, and you're walking in your calling and you're starting to win battles and victories and things are happening in your life and you're going, what is happening? I know me. I'm aware of my sin nature. I'm aware of my rebellion. I'm aware of my own desires, but somehow the grace of God is operating in me and it just feels like grace. There's an ease to it. That's the grace of God. It's like driving. You're not Fred Flintstone and you're just paddling underneath, right? You just push him down on the accelerator and that car is going. You need the Ferrari grace of God. There are some issues right now in your life, maybe some circumstances where you're looking at it and you're going, God, I can't do this. God, I can't be who you're calling me to be. God, I can't live pure. God, I can't, my business can't grow this year. Lord, this relationship, is, it, it's, got, it's taken its last breath. I'm done in this relationship. And God's going, you need some grace because you're trying to do this on your own. And I've never meant for you to walk a supernatural life with me apart from my grace. I can enable you. Look at this, this passage of scripture, Titus 2. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. It teaches us. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. I need the grace of God to say no because I want to say yes. My sin nature is saying yes to ungodliness and worldly passions and no to living self-controlled, upright, and godly life. But the grace of God can come and teach me to say no. There's times I I just pray, Lord, I need you to change my, I need your grace right now. I need your power towards me to be who I'm called to be and to do what I'm called to do. God, I need your grace. How often do we pray that and ask that? God, I can't do this. I think he loves that because of the humility in it. Yeah, I've been waiting for you to say that. Because see, I kind of want to give you my Ferrari grace so that you can be aware that, of, of how I've been operating in your life. You're taking all the credit for your driving. And I need to get some glory. God's passionate, passionate about not sharing glory, by the way. We come to the end of ourselves and we're like, Lord, I, I can't do this. God's going, ah, oh, yes, that's beautiful. Now I can allow my grace to come into your life. This is my last passage of scripture, 1 Peter 5. Notice the context of this passage. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then it says, once again, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm humble before God. It's kind of easy to be humble before God. You know, it's like, Lord, I'm humble before you. Okay, you're good, and I'm not good. You know, you're, you're the one that knows everything. I don't know everything. But it's really difficult to be like that towards other people. But in this passage, it tells me that when I humble myself towards others, I'm humbling myself before God. Now that sucks. Because I don't like to humble myself before my wife. At all. She loves it. I can't stand it. I'm proud. And I don't want other people to know about my issues. But God says that when I humble myself before others, I'm humbling myself before him. And he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You see, I don't want to be a God resister. I want nothing in my life to resist him. Because I need Ferrari grace. I desperately need Ferrari grace in my life. 
and it is available to me, but God will oppose me and not allow me to have Ferrari grace if I refuse to humble myself before Him and I humble myself before Him when I humble myself before others. That's how it works. A little bit too practical, isn't it? It's it's too practical. That's where we struggle. The supernatural isn't always spectacular. The supernatural many times is super ordinary. This is a great example of that. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so at the proper time He may exalt you. And that at the proper time He may lift you up. About a year ago, I'm going to end with this. About a year ago, I put my hand up. I was like, Pastor, I am struggling. I've, I'd been dealing with some anxiety. I'd had probably anxiety throughout my life. But I was having some serious anxiety issues. And one of the manifestations of the anxiety was uh, in flying. Uh, manifesting self in flight fear. I don't know about you, but I have never been a really good flyer. And the frustrating thing about it is that I have to fly every week. So I flew, well, the plane did all the work. (laughs) But I flew here yesterday. I'm flying home tomorrow. I'm flying this coming weekend to Portland. Then I'm flying to Orlando in the midweek. Then I'm flying to Saskatoon, Canada the next weekend that I'm flying to Australia. It's a lot, that's a lot of ocean to fly over, by the way, when you fly to Australia. Like my, my hyperactive brain is like, there's no land. What do we do in an emergency? Um, I would get these knots in my stomach and this like panic so bad that, that I'd, I'd get to the airport and I'd just be like, I'd turn around, I'd just go home. I, not, I can't fly today, it's not happening. I've literally gotten off of flights. I like walk in, I'm just like, and no. (laughs) So I put my hand up and I started to, you know, and go see a psychologist. I'm not going to see a psychologist. You know, no, you need to go see a psychologist. Okay, so I go see a psychologist. Psychologist goes to our church. I'm just like, oh, great. Here, I'm a man of God. You know, like I'm supposed to be the man of faith and I'm having to tell my psychologist, uh, this wonderful young lady, you know, which was probably a little bit more embarrassing because my male ego was so bruised. (laughs) Yes, I'm afraid of things. And so she began to um, put me, like, um, put me into this cognitive behavioral therapy. Nate, I want you to start doing some meditation. I want to start doing this. I'm like, meditation? Now, I wanted God to heal me through Catherine Coleman and Benny Hinn. I was looking for a charismatic moment, you know, you know, somebody to lay hands on me that's wearing all white, you know, in a tent, and it's all sweaty out. But I didn't get that. I got Dr. Ariana. And so I did the exercises for six months, and after about six months, my flight anxiety not only reversed, but like, I love flying now. And I'm not just saying that. I actually love it. I'm obsessed with it now. I actually have fun. There was like bad turbulence yesterday. I'm like bumping around and having fun. Everybody else is like, Jesus. And I'm like, yes, Jesus. You know, like working on the plane, watch movies. I enjoy it. And there's been healing in my life. And I believe it's been the grace of God to be who I'm called to be and to do what I'm called to do. And I've decided, Lord, this is what I'm called to. And if I'm called to it, then there's grace for it. And if there's grace for it, it will not be without effect. It will be tangible. It will be something that is touchable. God, if you're in it, I can do it. If you've called me to purity, I can be pure. If you've called me to this relationship and this marriage, then I can be in it. There's grace for it. God, if you've called me to this business, then there's grace for it. God, whatever you've called me to, there will be grace for it. As I clothe myself in humility and put up my hand and say, God, I need grace.